Hello, I'm Patrick McGuire once again, and thank you for joining us in the next of our segments of Overcoming the Paradigms of Christianity. And last time we, uh, we were talking about Paul, and we're continuing this, this segment that I've called, But Didn't Paul Say Such and Such? And we're studying now the uh, misunderstood and, I think, mistaught Apostle Paul. Now, there are many people that believe Paul came and started a new religion, that uh, Paul, Paul did away with Judaism, and he was done with that, and he came and he grabbed the Gentile people and said, we're starting a new religion now, and this is, we're, we're just concentrating on Jesus, we're forgetting everything else, and this is all we're doing. That is not what Paul did. Paul, even late in his life, said, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of Torah. And he said that he loves Torah and believes everything written in Torah and in the Tanakh. We brought that up last time. So the misconception that Paul is starting a new religion, you have, two, you have essentially two different ways of looking at it. One, Paul and Jesus got together and said, we're going to start a new religion. Or did, did Paul, was he on a quest to bring the Gentiles in to the household and commonwealth of Israel. It's, it's one or the other. And I think we're going to help straighten out that misconception that Paul is starting some kind of new religion, some kind of new thing where we can discard righteousness, we can discard belief that sin exists. People believe that Paul just did away with Torah. Well, doing away with Torah does nothing but take away uh, man's moral concept of what's right and wrong. What good is that? Torah was not done away with. Paul took Torah and embraced it and taught it to the people. Now one section here that I want to talk about or one phrase that's used a lot is that Paul said, well, let each man be convinced in his own mind. And if you're convinced you need to honor the Sabbath, then, then you go right ahead. And, and if I'm convinced I need to worship on Sunday, then I will. And, and let, you know, once again, let each man be convinced in his own mind. And where does that phrase come from? That's another section in Romans. It's uh, Romans 14, verses 5 and 6. Let's take a look at it. Paul says, One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the master, and he who eats does it for the master. For he who, give, for he who gives thanks to Elohim, and he who does not, for the master he does not eat and gives thanks to Elohim. Well, <clears throat> he, is he saying here that each man should be convinced in his own mind as to what sin is? <clears throat> this is tantamount to saying we should follow our hearts. I've heard many Christians tell me this. I follow my heart. I talk to God. God talks to me. That's what I follow. Well, when we say we should follow our hearts, we're saying we're not really going to go by the, what uh, the word of Elohim says. We're going to go by what our gut feelings are. We're going to go by our instincts. We're going to go by our heart. What does Scripture te teach about our heart? Scripture says, do not follow your heart. Look in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 16, verse 12. You too have done evil, even more than your forefathers. For behold, this is what people are doing today. You are each one walking according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. So instead of obeying Torah, what we're doing here, what the majority of the world does, is that they follow their own heart. Because of a few phrases of Paul Look at Proverbs 28, verse 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Don't be a fool. Don't walk according to your own heart. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3 says, This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. And insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. So what's Paul referring to in this passage? Is he saying, going ahead, go ahead and follow your heart? Ah, no, Elohim in his scriptures throughout says the heart is evil, but you need to follow your heart. 
<clears throat> Does Paul know the scripture says that man's heart is evil? Yes, because Paul is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows the scriptures very well. Yeshua agreed with scripture about the contents of the heart. In Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. Yeshua doesn't say that good things come out of our heart and we should follow it. He listed seven things there. Seven, the number seven in scripture is, is a reference to completeness. The heart is decept deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Well, this passage by Paul in Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, is very simply misunderstood because we pluck those phrases from the entire passage. This is what I see out of people that are antinomians, that teach anti-law, that teach that we should disobey Elohim, and somehow that makes us right with him. Uh, if you think about the logic of that, just think about it. It's ridiculous, okay? We should... This is what I've been told by many, many Christians. We should disobey the law of Elohim. We should disobey it. That way we're not earning our way to heaven. And I would agree with that. You're not. You're not earning your way to heaven through disobedience. We don't earn our way. We, we get our salvation. We are a part of the kingdom of heaven because his spirit is within us. It's the new covenant that saves us. That new covenant came through the blood of Messiah. It's through Messiah that we have the new covenant. His spirit is within us. It causes us to obey his laws, commandments, statutes, and ordinances. We have a desire to follow those laws and commandments and statutes and ordinances. His entire Torah, we want to please him. That means that Torah then is not just a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's not just a bunch of rules and regulations. It changes everything. To the Jews, it was a bunch of rules and regulations. I'm going to follow it. And they couldn't, and they didn't, and they added to it. They added to it with their oral Torah, with their Jewish Talmud. And in their Talmud, they, they made the Torah of Elohim of no effect. And they did many such things. Read Mark 7, read Matthew 15, both of those accounts. Yeshua is attacking the Talmudic oral Torah traditions of Judaism. Because they took their oral Torah, their oral traditions, and put them on the same level with the Torah of Elohim. And he said, because of this, you make the Torah of Elohim of no effect. Well, what's Paul talking about then? Follow your heart. What's, what's he talking about? Quit plucking passages out of the middle of what Paul is speaking of. Look in Romans 14, verse 1. We'll see the context of everything he's talking about in this entire chapter. Romans 14, verse 1 in the New American Standard says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. In this passage, he's talking about the opinions of people. He's, in other words, it's things that are outside of Torah. That's what this is referring to. In the New King James, it says, Receive one who is weak in faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Torah is not a doubtful thing. Torah is your solid, it's a solid foundation of a believer. Torah is what's solid, but disputes over doubtful things. <clears throat> that is what is being spoken of here. If something is not stated in Torah, we need to be convinced in our minds how to handle it. Then Paul gives examples of things like celebrating birthdays or state holidays or Jewish holidays. And look at this again. <clears throat> He's saying, uh, and let's read it again, Romans 14, verses 5 and 6. One man regards one day above another uh, birthdays. Uh, in, in our assembly, there are those that say we shouldn't celebrate birthdays. Others say we should. Some people say, well, don't celebrate state holidays. Okay, don't celebrate 4th of July. Some say, well, that's good. That's fine. Why? I mean, I'm convinced in my mind it's fine. I'm convinced in my mind it's fine to celebrate birthdays. I see nothing in Scripture against it. I'm convinced in my mind we can celebrate state holidays if we want. I see nothing wrong with that. Some people do. That's what Paul's referring to. One man regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Doesn't that make sense? If you have a conviction against celebrating birthdays, there's two instances in Scripture, I believe, where, where, where birthdays are celebrated. One was with Pharaoh, one was with Herod, I believe. And 
and both were evil situations and people use that as, as justification for not celebrating birthdays that's fine if you don't want to be convinced in your own mind if it's not specifically spelled out in Torah you need to be convinced in your own mind now notice here in this uh, in this passage Romans 14 verses 5 and 6 I want you to go up to your television screen and put your finger on the word Sabbath I'll wait a minute Go ahead, I'm going to hold this up on the screen for you. Show me where it says Sabbath or feast days. So where it says don't celebrate feast days, don't celebrate Sabbath. Where does it say that? It doesn't say that. He does not mention those, uh, the Sabbath or the feast days or anything like that. They are specifically mentioned and not just mentioned in Torah, they're specifically commanded in Torah. Read Leviticus 23. Read the ver first couple of verses in Leviticus 23. Elohim says, these are my appointed feast days. These are Elohim's appointed days. Not mine, not Jewish ones. These are his appointments that he has with his people. Have you been missing your appointments with Elohim? They're set up. The times are set. If you don't want to come then, you want to come when you're ready. Well, tell the doctor that next time you make a doctor appointment. You know, you Tuesday at 10, but yeah, I didn't want to come then. So I'm here Wednesday at 3, so let's get going. The doctor will say, yeah, get going. I'm not going to see you. You missed your appointment. Don't miss your appointments with Elohim. He set them up. Learn how to find them. Learn what they are. Know what they are. His people have a desire to learn these things. Just because someone is convinced in their own minds that they should steal or commit adultery does not justify sin. Paul is only referring to things in this chapter concerning men's opinions not mentioned in Torah. Things that are disputable. Things that, well, I think. That's what he says. Well, on those things you need to be convinced in your own mind. <clears throat> Let's look at another phrase that Paul said that is so often misinterpreted, that is so often misconstrued. Jesus broke down the dividing wall of the law. Now this misquote comes from Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15. We're going to look at this in, in depth here. Let's just read the passage first. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the Torah of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now in that first verse he says, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now he's developing this theme that we're all one with Israel. We're now a part of the nation of Israel and a part of the covenants of Israel. Now the middle wall of separation, we're going to talk about that in, in more depth, is Jewish hatred for Gentiles as spelled out in the oral Torah. That is now gone in their oral traditions in the Talmud. The law of commandments contained in ordinances, which is in verse 15, is the oral Torah, the Talmud, and all its traditions that were somehow equated with Elohim's law by the Jewish people. Now let's look at that term for ordinances. That term for ordinances is the Greek word dogma. <clears throat> Elohim's word is not dogma. Dogma is that oral tradition. It's the Jewish Talmud. It has nothing to do with scripture. Paul is describing things outside of scripture that are being followed by the Jewish people to keep the Gentiles out. They did not want the Gentiles in. Why did they not want the Gentiles in? They were willing for the Gentiles to be a part of Israel, okay, if they do it the Jewish way. The Jewish way was to, for the men to get circumcised, for them to do sacrifices, for uh, them to undergo several months of instruction. Then they can be brought in through a taval, which is a baptism, which according to the Talmud, when a Gentile goes into the waters of baptism and comes out, he is as much of a Jew as those who were a blood Jew all their lives. So that's how Gentiles are allowed to be brought in, not through the blood of Messiah, but through Judaism. Through the works of Judaism is what brought people in. 
Paul is saying that dividing wall is now gone. That dogma spoken of here is now gone. Now let's look at this passage one more time. <clears throat> For anyone to claim that this is speaking of Elohim's Torah is speaking without engaging their brain. How on earth could Paul have been saying that Elohim's law is enmity? What is enmity? Enmity is extreme hatred. Paul never spoke of Elohim's Torah in this manner. We already saw in Romans where he says uh, the Torah is good, it's, it's, it's holy, it's spiritual. It's not extreme hatred. Elohim says he shows mercy for the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Keeping his commandments, keeping his Torah is love. It's not extreme hate. Where they come up with this, I have no idea, and they should be ashamed of themselves for even thinking that's speaking of Torah. That <clears throat> On the contrary, Paul says Torah is love. Look at 1 Timothy 1.8. But we know the Torah is good if one uses it lawfully. There are many who teach that Paul has said we need to get rid of Torah, that we shouldn't follow Torah, that Torahs are a shackle or whatever. Uh, and then at times Paul says that, that Torah is good and uh, holy and spiritual. Uh, but they forget about those things and they focus on what they think Paul is saying that condemns Torah, that condemns the instructions of Elohim. If that is the case, if that is the case, that Paul is saying do away with the instructions of Elohim, do away with Torah, do away with the Sabbath day, do away with the feast days, do away with the dietary regulations which are for our health and benefit, do away with the ways uh, Torah says to, to conduct business, uh, do away with uh, loving your neighbor. If Paul says really we need to do away with those things, Paul is contradicting the words of Yeshua himself who says in Matthew 5, not one jot or tittle of Torah will pass away until all things have been accomplished. Romans 3 verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled or made full. The Greek word uh, playroom means made full Torah. You have made Torah full if you've truly loved your neighbor. Galatians 5 14, For the whole Torah is fulfilled. Made full, once again, the Greek word playru, in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> this entire passage of Ephesians 2, chapters 2 and 3, is explaining the fact that if we have his spirit within us, we become a part of Israel. Paul was big on explaining the new covenant to people. It's throughout his writings. Now the Jewish peoples did, uh, people did not want the Gentiles to be a part of Israel unless they followed the oral traditions of their Talmud. That is what was removed by Yeshua. Now Paul says you can become a part of the commonwealth of Israel without Judaism. Look in Ephesians 2. Let's start at verse 12. Let's read verse, verses uh, 12 and 13. Remember that you were at that time separate from Messiah excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. And skipping on down to verse 19, then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and are of Elohim's household. He says in verse 13, but now in Messiah Yeshua, you who formerly were far off, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, have been brought near. Been brought near to what? By the blood of Messiah. Been brought near to the commonwealth of Israel. That's why he says in verse 19, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of Elohim's household, part of Israel. And if you look at Ephesians 3 verse 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. Fellow heirs and fellow members of what body? He's speaking of the commonwealth of Israel. And fellow partakers of the promise in Messiah Yeshua through the gospel. 
<clears throat> now, another passage that is taught terribly wrong along these same lines is Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. Let's take a look at that. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, we made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the cert certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. <clears throat> the same word here um, where it says in verse 14, certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. There goes that Greek word dogma again. Consisting of dogma against us, which was hostile to us. There's that extreme enmity again. What is Paul speaking of here? He's speaking of the exact same thing he's speaking of in Ephesians 2 that we just read. <clears throat> he's speaking of those same traditions of Talmud. He explicitly states a few verses earlier. Let's look at Colossians 2, verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Messiah. Paul says, he doesn't say, see that no one takes you captive through Torah. He doesn't say that because that's not what he means. He says, let no one take you captive through philosophy and empty deception. The point is, Paul says we are to follow the instructions of the Father. The instructions of the Father are given to us in the first five books of Scripture. Learn them, read them, and study them. They are what Scripture calls life. Let's look at another passage. We're justified by faith, not by works of the law. <clears throat> this is another passage in Romans. This time it's Romans 3, verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by, pay, by faith apart from from works of the law. Look at what Paul's doing here. It's another contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Remember with the Old Covenant, it was, I don't need Yeshua. I will be, uh, I'll be justified to the Father on my own. I don't need the Father. Or I don't need Messiah. I'm justified through obeying Torah versus the New Covenant, which is, I have failed. I can't achieve perfection. I need the spirit of Elohim within me to give me the desire to write Torah on my heart and on my mind, to give me a love for the Father that I don't have on my own. Paul is saying that right here. He's making another contrast for it, for those two covenants. It's only through having the spirit within you that gives you a heart for Torah. We see that it's through the faith that is given to us through the spirit of Elohim that establishes Torah in our hearts and minds. Let's look at the whole passage. Let's, this verse and phrase plucking is what, is what church has thrived upon to condemn Torah. Phrase plucking from the Apostle Paul. Let's look at the whole passage. Romans 3, starting at verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of Torah. Or is Elohim the Elohim of Jews only? Is he not the Elohim of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed Elohim, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. So if you have his spirit within you, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Paul uses circumcised and uncircumcised to refer to uh, Jew and Gentile. And Paul never wanted Jews to become Gentiles and Gentiles to become Jews. He wanted people to be who they were, but to be Torah obedient to the Father. And he continues saying, verse 31, Do we then nullify Torah through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish Torah. Paul just verifies what we've been saying about the new covenant. It's the faith that's implanted in you through the spirit of Elohim that writes your Torah, of uh, the Torah in your heart and in your mind that establishes Torah. It's the faith that establishes Torah. And that's a gift of his spirit within you. It's nothing you've done. <clears throat> That's why James tells us that if we don't obey Torah, we're not saved. If we say that we have faith without the works of Torah, our faith is dead. 
because it's the works of Torah that come from your faith. James says in chapter 2, starting in verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. If you claim to have faith, Paul says, or uh, John, uh, excuse me, James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. How can that be? Well, it's simple because your faith is the implanting of the spirit within you that writes his Torah on your hearts and minds and it will show. <clears throat> this is an introduction to the passages of Paul that have been terribly, terribly misinterpreted. There are more. As a matter of fact, we're going to devote a whole DVD to the book of Galatians in the near future, and I think you will uh, see that the book of Galatians is, is a wonderful writing on, uh, on Paul's part and not a writing that says we should disobey the Torah of Elohim. On the other hand, it is a writing <clears throat> that says don't become a Jew in order to get close to Elohim. He tells people to be what they are. He wants people to maintain what they are. Just because you obey Torah it doesn't mean he doesn't want you to be an Arkansan anymore or an American or whatever. Paul wants us to maintain what we are. Be who you are, but be obedient to the Father. Keep in mind that Paul has been terribly, terribly misunderstood in our day. But there's a secret. Paul was terribly misunderstood in his day. Peter warns us not to twist the words of Paul in other scripture to our own destruction. He says, Peter tells us, man, that Paul, the writings of Paul, they're tough. And there's a friend of mine just recently told me that he didn't, she didn't like the writings of Paul because she thought he was double-minded. Torah yes, Torah no. Follow him yes, follow him no. And in some ways, it seems that way. Well, Peter had the same problem with Paul. Let's take a look at what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, starting at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, which means follow Torah, and regard the patience of our master to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. He's saying that Paul in all his letters wrote about you need to be in peace, spotless and blameless, and, and, and which means follow Torah. He says in Paul's letters, in which are some things hard to understand. Peter says some of his letters, they're hard to understand. And this is what happens, which the untaught, and the unstable distort as they also do to the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. If you are under a Bible teacher or a pastor or a priest or whatever that tells you you need to quit following Torah, you shouldn't follow Torah, to even follow Torah will send you to hell, these are the men that will receive the greatest condemnation. They are the ones that are leading people to death and to hell to eternal damnation telling them to disobey the Father. And that's, they're twisting scripture, the words of Paul and the rest of scripture, to their own de destruction and to those who follow them. And we're out of time. And may Yahweh bless you and keep you. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>